Hello, everyone, and welcome to today, today's FP virtual dialogue focused on actionable intelligence during crises. I'm Andrew Solinger, publisher of Foreign Policy, and I'm very pleased to be your host today. Today, we'll explore the world of Earth observation and intelligence gathering and the importance of US government and commercial cooperation to drive innovation and infrastructure. We've got a great set of panelists, including a top executive from Maxar, our partner in this dialogue, and the leader in satellite imagery. We also have top officials from the intelligence, space, and warfighter communities. So we're excited to get going with this conversation. But first, a little bit of obligatory housekeeping. We're very delighted that you're all tuned in with us this morning, and we want to hear from you. So please ask questions. We very much encourage these from our global audience. And we want you to submit those throughout the discussion. I will try and bring those questions up when relevant as we talk with our guests. Um, please send your questions as they come to mind. Um, and, uh, and again, I will also ask them at the end. If you're on Zoom, you can click on the Q&A button and submit your questions. Tell us your name, your organization and location, which is very helpful for context, nothing more. And be sure to direct your question at a particular speaker if you can. And if you're joining us on the phone or via live stream, you can email us your questions. The address to email is events at foreignpolicy.com. Lastly, we want you to participate via social as well. Please chime in using the hashtag enhanced space intel. And if you do that, uh, our media team will retweet you and you'll get lots of followers, so extra incentive. Let's get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and partner, Tony Frazier, EVP of Global Field Operations at Maxar. Tony, please turn on your camera and unmute your mic. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Tony, how are you? Doing great. Thank, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so you came to Maxar via the acquisition of Digital Globe in 2017, where you were for 10 years, and now you head all field operations at Maxar. You were previously president of Radiant, GM of Digital Globe Services, and a senior exec at GOI. You're a much smarter guy than me on this uh, on this topic. And uh, while we've got an audience of uh, nearly a thousand uh, geopolitical influencers signed up for this discussion, uh, and they're all professionals and academics from around the globe, um, watching and listening, only some of them are hardcore um, geospatial intelligence or geoint uh, for those in the know. Um, uh, experts. Many of them uh, know a great deal about national security, of course, and are familiar with it, but many more are, are less involved in the technology and they're interested in learning more. And that's why they've signed up. So um, as I've discussed with you, my understanding and, and knowledge of my frequent use of, uh, of Maxar imagery is when I go to Google Maps and look up the address of my house and then uh, click on satellite and zoom out and I see my house from space. So that's an image from generally, usually an, an image from Maxar, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And th that's how my mom and, and kids <laughs> you know, introduce Maxar. <laughs> so. Great. so I'm glad I'm glad I'm introducing it the way the family does. Um, so just so I'm clear, you guys are watching our houses all day. And should that make us feel safe and secure or scared? Well, I, I would I would vote for safe and secure. So uh, so yeah, Maxar, as you mentioned, we've gone through quite a bit of change uh, over the past three years, but uh, we were formed through the combination of uh, Digital Globe uh, and MDA uh, to create Maxar, but we had several other brands uh, that people knew us uh, from different points of origin. So uh, Radiant Solutions was our geospatial services business and uh, SSL, Space Systems of RAL, uh, was our space manufacturing uh, organization. And the vision we had at the time was that the combination of Earth intelligence and space infrastructure uh, could deliver solutions to both the public and private sector to be able to make a real contribution for a better world. Uh, so that's really kind of what we wake up every day uh, focused on. And you know, our I, I think it's important as it relates to this discussion because being in the uh, kind of this intersection of the public and private sector is core to our business. Uh, our Earth intelligence business, uh, we own and operate a constellation of satellites. Uh, we have an extensive global ground infrastructure. We built 
ways to uh, to, to take all that data, so over 100 petabytes of data, and turn it into information and enable analytics. And so a lot of what we do is, is we're providing that as a service to both our U.S. government customers, but then many of our uh, international government customers, so dozens of allies around the world, many global development organizations, many commercial companies like Google, Apple, and Microsoft, you know, they all leverage that same foundation, but then they're powering different applications. And so it's a, it's a really exciting time. I think, you know, in terms of our ability to, to really, um, you know, see, understand, admire change uh, around our planet, you know, it, it helps enable, you know, many, many use cases uh, that, that are relevant today, but then, you know, where the market's going tomorrow, you know, we're really excited about the future. That's great. And, and that's a great uh, uh, use cases um, are, are, are many and varied, and they're actually very personal to me, too. I was also, of course, you know, kidding about the Google bit. We use Maxar imagery at FP, and I'd like to share with the audience a little bit of how we use um, Maxar imagery. So here is an example of a story that we ran um, this summer. Our excellent Robbie Gramer did it in July, and it's about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which has become a bit of a flashpoint issue for downriver Nile nations like Egypt, because uh, the Nile is obviously the source of, uh, of life and, and agriculture in, in the entire Nile Delta. This slide, uh, as you see, it's static, but you could see the line. We actually presented it as a, as a superimposed slider format, so you could illustrate the water capture behind the dam. Um, very, very cool stuff and, and, uh, and a really um, interesting way to represent um, what's happening in, in the Nile Delta. So that's one example. And I wanted to share uh, another example. Second um, is from a piece on the impact of COVID lockdowns on uh, carbon, carbon producing activity. Mm -hmm. um, so here we're showing the changes in traffic volume in downtown Madrid's uh, Paseo de la Castellana last year. So the left is, I think, September of last year. The middle is during the lockdown in March. You can keep, there's nobody on the road in this extremely uh, busy thoroughfare. And then on the right, you start to see activity picking up again. And that actually um, you know, speaks to a little bit about what we want to talk about later, the, the, um, uh, how this intel is especially effective now in a time of, uh, of crisis when, when, uh, when it's very difficult to gather um, intel on the ground. Um, and I expect that we will be calling on our Maxar colleagues for more imagery as well. I wanted to share one more example of a, of a imagery that is not from Maxar, but um, increasingly um, we are digging into areas that require this type of imagery to help shed insight and, and understanding. This is a composite slide from a new deep dive power map, um, as we call them, a research project on the Arctic that we created for high level uh, subscribers to FP Insider. Um, and the Arctic Power Map series offers an in-depth breakdown of how melting sea ice is enabling increased commercial activity and geopolitical competition um, over resources, shipping routes, territory, et cetera. So we're gonna ask you for more um, insights there, Tony. I hope you can, uh, can help us. So, so thank you for sharing um, the, those slides and sharing that, that imagery. Um, so you pointed this out. I wanted to dig into a little bit. This is a tremendous amount of data to consume. I mean, you're, you're, you're imaging the entire planet. Um, and I know that you um, led the analytic service business um, at, at, at the group. Tell us a little bit about how you can add some, make some sense of all this you know, tremendous um, intel that you're sharing with your, with your partners, agencies, commercial companies. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And, and um, it was great to see those specific examples. I think they do highlight the, the variety of use cases uh, we can support. The, the thing that I, I think is really exciting is when we look at the missions we serve today, you know, today we've been very focused on areas like, like mapping, uh, you know, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, you know, uh, change detection. And I think those, those map to the three, three use cases, you know, that you, you identified. And it requires not only lots of data, but high quality data. You know, so being able to see details uh, in the imagery that allow you to understand activity you know, on the ground or extract features. Uh, and so a lot of the early focus of our analytics business was on how do we automate certain workflows that are, um, you know, that, that today are very manual. And so one, one example, which I think uh, may, may tee up Ellen, you know, in her comments later is, that uh, we we frequently do mapping campaigns, and you know the the one of the, the the scenarios we've seen historically is that 
you know, to be able to put eyes on all that imagery, it would take, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people, you know, to be able to manually interpret all the features that are in, in an image. And, and so when a crisis causes change, you know, like the example you showed in Ethiopia, there's a need to be able to create the type of mapping data that would support safety navigation uh, and disaster response. And so one of the partnerships we've had with the State Department has been to support an effort called MapGive, uh, where we make imagery available to the public. Uh, and then we re recently had a mapping campaign with, um, uh, with the State Department to map areas in Nigeria, where if you were manually going to look at all that country, it's hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, uh, which would be would take months to do, you know, with you know hundreds or thousands of people. And what we were able to do was apply analytics to find the specific areas where there was change, and have several dozen people update the map, you know, in a matter of weeks. And so that's one example that we've seen that is uh, is really impressive. Um, the other area I would say is uh, we're we're investing in in um, additional derivatives that we can create. And so an example is uh, taking all that imagery that we collect at different angles and turning that into 3D data. And so we're using that now to support initiatives like creating a digital twin of the earth that can then feed different uh, training and wargaming you know, type applications. And so we're, we're partnering with Army on, uh, on that initiative. Uh, so those are just a couple examples. Um, the other big trend we're seeing is is uh, there's opportunities to collect data more with higher persistence. So we're launching new satellites next year. They're gonna allow us to see certain locations of the earth up to 15 times a day. And so being able to get those types of uh, alerts out that would then inform our early warning is an area that we're, we're also quite, quite excited about. That's interesting. And you're talking about the World Worldview Legion project, I believe that new um, a satellite array. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, how you know, how many satellites, what kind of investment is that? And how does that work that you could do? I mean, you're hovering over a location <laughs> or actually passing over a location 15 times a day. How does that work exactly? Yeah, so uh, so Legion is our next generation constellation. Uh, so we're going to be launching six satellites next year. And uh, the the real breakthrough was you know, a typical worldview satellite, you know, our current constellation, you know, those satellites cost between 600 and 800 million dollars to produce. Uh, and what we did was we made changes to the, uh, we miniaturized the electronics while maintaining the optics. So we still can collect the same quality of imagery, but do it on a smaller satellite, uh, which has allowed us to be able to deploy those satellites in different orbits. Um, and so, you know, if you think about the, the world, sun synchronous is going kind of around the world in this direction. There's mid inclination, which would kind of go more you know, uh, at, a, at an angle. And so that allows you to be able to see different areas of the world more frequently. And so, so with uh, the launch of the six satellites next year and the orbits we're gonna place them in, it's gonna allow us to, in certain hotspots around the world to get that increased persistence. And so that opens up a whole new set of use cases uh, for, for our customers. Many of our intelligence customers are really excited about the potential to be able to monitor thousands of locations and get you know, early warning of a, of a trending event, you know, like, like some of the areas that you, you highlighted earlier. That's great. And uh, we're already getting questions from the um, audience. Um, Rich Bisk um, from uh, Austin, Texas um, uh, has a question for you. Uh, wants to know, you know, beyond the terrestrial objects that you map, um, it will in the future, you also map um, space objects in orbit or even um, lunar or Mars um, uh, uh, territory when we establish presence there? It's a great, great question. Uh, it, it definitely is something that we're, uh, we're exploring. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the whole area of near Earth imaging, as, as there's more proliferation of assets in space, it was an area that we're, uh, that we're looking at as a way to add similar types of mapping and foundational intelligence and early warning that we offer treacherously you know, in the space domain. One of the other aspects of Maxar that we have is we, we're supporting a number of the emerging missions that NASA is, um, is driving, like the Artemis program, you know, where we're sending the next man, the first woman, uh, to the moon uh, by 2024. And so we're supporting that program through 
uh, a an award called the Power Propulsion Element, you know, which uh, we were leveraging our propulsion capability to be able to support uh, both uh, the the Lunar Gateway project, but then support broader um, cislunar type missions as well. Excellent. I, and I've got another question for you. This is from uh, uh, some uh, an astronomer. It sounds like um, who's who's interested to. Uh, get access. Um, there, there has been, um, and this is a little, you know, what, 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 it'd be interesting to know how you feel this. There's been uh, unfortunate tension between the national security and astronomy communities, precluding advanced telescope development. Um, what can geospatial imaging um, that community do to help share and improve loosen restrictions on upward pointing uh, imaging uh, technology? Again, that's upward pointing, not um, downward pointing, which is what <laughs> I'm wondering if you had a, have a thought on that or want to take a pass. Uh, probably more of a pass. I, I, happy to get our the right experts. Okay, great. And a follow up. Just thought, just thought I'd ask. So, um, and thank you again for that example on um, uh, this with the State Department and the Open Street Map project you mentioned um, in Nigeria. That's that's really uh, 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 quite interesting, and we're going to touch on that certainly with uh, on the next panel. Um, maybe also considering the the panelists that we have coming up. Um, tell us a little bit about um, the work that you do with NGA, which is obviously one of the primary consumers of, of what you're doing, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, especially going into COVID, um, uh, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things that is we, we've been highlighting as a, as a real success story, I mean, our team is very mission driven. Uh, and so you know, while we've all had to adapt and respond you know, to the pandemic, you know, being able to keep mission moving forward, you know, despite uh, the, the changes in our work posture is an area that we've uh, been, that we, we, we got ahead of, you know, as things started to, to, to uh, spiral, you know, with, with COVID. And, and so with the NGA specifically, you know, they've done an awesome job of going from having a small amount of their workforce, you know, uh, adopting telework, you know, to being able to support much higher volume. So uh, Vice Admiral Sharp, who, who leads the agency, you know, frequently references that they went from 300 concurrent uh, users operating in the unclassified domain to, to I think, 7, 8,000 uh, users in a matter of, of uh, weeks. And so as part of that, we had been engaged on how to leverage the commercial data and tools that we made available in the unclassified environment to enable telework. And so one of our uh, flagship programs is uh, it's called Global Enhanced Unit Delivery, uh, where we serve out billions of square kilometers of imagery out uh, to users across the, the US government and several allies. And then we have a mapping tool called the NGA Open Mapping Enclave, uh, where um, you know, users can continue to advance mission. And so you know, since March, when we took that application online, or the application was online, but we started to scale up usage uh, to telework, we saw, uh, I think we're north of 200 mapping campaigns uh, complete. We've mapped over 12 million square kilometers of land mass. So we've continued to be able to advance mission uh, despite the challenges of COVID. And you know, one of the things in my conversations with Admiral Sharp and other leadership at NGA is that you know this is actually teaching us you know new patterns that's going to change how we do business in the future. And I think you know the whole trend of being able to support NAF security missions leveraging unclassified resources uh, I feel is going to you know create a lot of uh, a force multiplier for the for the community. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely dig into that classified versus unclassified um, you know categorization in, in a little bit. That's really helpful. A, a couple of other questions for me from from our, for you from our audience that are um, very interested actually in the um, uh, uh, globally competitive and uh, 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 environment and alliance space. So um, we'll take these two together. Um, one is from uh, Lewis McMurrin um, in Washington State, um, who's curious to know how active Russia and China are in gathering satellite imagery of the U.S. and do they have their own versions of Maxar? Um, there's only one Maxar, of course. And then a related but kind of opposite question, um, in the new satellite um, constellation or an existing ones, how do you synchronize and work with our partners like um, the Five Eyes uh, mm -hmm. And this is, these are also questions we can ask our panel, but curious for your take on, on both of those. Yeah, I think, well, I think that the Bucky's gonna, they'll probably speak to some of the, the broader dynamic, competitive dynamic, but in my perspective on it, and Maxar's perspective is, 
you know, the this whole shift to great power competition is definitely taking place in space. <laughs> uh, so so our in terms of of um, you know specific um, uh, nations, you know, China has been very active. Uh, I mean, they're they're launching hundreds of of uh, remote sensing, you know, satellites. Uh, they're also investing in, you know, uh, cloud technologies to do AI and machine learning. And so, you know, we're seeing that as a growing trend. Um, and and so, you know, we're we're definitely in a global competition as a nation. And I would say uh, that also affects the industrial base. Uh, you know, we still feel very confident, you know, in being the industry leader uh, in our class of, of capabilities, but that's why we are continuing to invest to extend our lead. Um, you know, with respect to the the I'm sorry the other the other question the other question is more around our allies and how we our allies, that. Yeah. again probably a question for our panel but from your perspective on that yeah so we we've been I mean that's for quarter of our fundamental our, our model so as I mentioned earlier we have um, over 50 international governments that are adopting Maxar uh, services and so uh, there's really kind of two aspects to how we go to market one is yeah you know, we provide commercial services to uh, allies. So, for example, the Australian, you know, government uh, is a direct customer, and you know they have they've deployed multiple ground stations, and you know they uh, have control of the satellite and you know in downlink data for their specific missions. The other really powerful part of our value proposition to the U.S. government is that uh, all of our imagery is shareable, and so part of the uh, the license that we provide to the U.S. government is called the Next View license. It allows for sharing with allies around common missions. And so we really have both direct relationships with sovereign nations, and then we also support uh, coalition activities you know, through, through shareable intelligence. Great, excellent. This is really uh, a ton more questions coming in for you, Tony. This is really informative, but I tell you what, why don't we hold on those, um, if I could, um, and ask you to stick around for more questions. We'll go to the panel now, and then if I could invite you back in and we'll field some of those as well. Does that work? That sounds great. Okay, okay. thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, wow, that was a wonderful way to tee up um, a great conversation we have coming up as well um, on why GeoInt matters. So uh, we're gonna talk with the next panel on what makes it particularly crucial now how different agencies are working to effectively turn Earth observation into actionable intelligence, uh, key emphasis on actionable, as well as efforts underway to ensure innovation and investment in our space-based infrastructure to continue our leadership in space, as we were just discussing with Tony, and how this is supporting our national security priorities overall. So joining us now to explore these and other questions, we are very, very fortunate to have Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence and Research Ellen McCarthy. Uh, also, um, Steve Butow, head of the Defense Innovation Unit's space portfolio, and Phil Chidoba, who is Associate Director for Capabilities at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA. Welcome to you all. Please unmute your mics and turn on your video, if you would, and join us. And I'd like to continue to uh, remind the audience to please submit questions as they arise. Thanks so much. Great, Ellen, um, you've been um, uh, Assistant Secretary of Intel and Research at State, um, or a group that's called INR, known as INR, the, the letters, for two years now. And prior to that, you were at NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. It would be great if you give us some background and tell us um, exactly what INR is and, and what you do, what it does. Well, thank you so much for um, having me here today. I've got to tell you, I could have listened to Tony Frazier forever. He was fascinating. Um, so INR is one of the 16 intelligence elements in the intelligence community. We are an all source element. We're a little unique in that we're a bureau within the Department of State, but we're also an intelligence agency. We view ourselves as the State Department's intelligence agency. Our primary customer is the Secretary of State and the senior decision makers, but our intelligence is used by all the posts and the rest of the intelligence community um, um, around the world, stationed around the world. Our focus is support to foreign policy, which is also makes us a little different. And because we are embedded with the policymaker, um, we tend to uh, have, have some pretty unique insights into the, into the needs of the policymaker. But addition, in addition to this all source intelligence role, 
we also are the home of the geographer of the United States. And so that's where this discussion is incredibly intriguing because um, uh, my boss, the Secretary of State, asked me at my first day in, he said, you know, Ellen, I'm tired of reading five pages of well-written prose. I'd like to see the data. And so this is where the geographer of the United States and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the team that runs global issues is incredibly important. That's great. That sounds like an old world term, a, a geographer. Um, how, does, how does geospatial fit into um, uh, that role? How does it fit in uh, uh, to, to what you're providing for the secretary and, and, and your fellow diplomats? Well, I'll tell you that um, this office was doing geospatial before there was even geospatial. I mean, this it, it actually this this capability was created about a hundred years ago, um, and it's it's geographers and folks who were studying and supporting geopolitical analysis. Of course, so geospatial um, intelligence now plays an incredible role. Whether we are um, laying out and identifying boundaries, whether we are supporting um, uh, war crime tribunals or um, humanitarian events. Um, we have a team of people who work very closely with NGA and others across the government um, to provide those imagery resources to policymakers around the world. Great. And um, maybe we could ask a question about how this intelligence gathering has been impacted by um, COVID-19. We talked about that a little bit um, with um, Tony, and we'll talk further about that with Phil at NGA, but um, how you've had to pivot um, in this time of crisis and, um, and what, what that's done for you, that um, uh, uh, geo hint. You know, I gotta tell you, I think COVID, of course it stinks, but there are some also unique um, uh, opportunities that we've been able to take advantage of as a result of COVID. So INR is a little different from some of the, some of the other Intel elements in that the basis for everything we do is based in sort of open source, publicly available information, cables and other reporting. So we start at this level, which means that when it comes to um, having you know, our workforce sit at home in some cases, um, they're able to continue pressing ahead. In fact, um, we started a whole new product line as a result of COVID. Um, called the commentary, the INR commentary, which is based completely on open source information. And we have um, our analysts and our Intel operators who have on average 17, 18, 19 years of experience in their area. They speak multiple languages and they're able to provide assessments based on um, open source reporting and research, um, geospatial information and provide this product. We've produced over 200 of them since COVID started with um, great response because now we're able to push this analysis out to folks who operate in that environment. So we're actually having a, a greater impact. Um, something else that we do right now that's that's unique that we've been able to take advantage of is we, we actually are host to the analytic outreach capability for the intelligence community. So we've taken advantage of webinars and Zoom and technology uh, to continue bringing in outside experts and who can, who can answer questions that uh, may provide a little diverse viewpoints on what the intelligence community is reporting on and Zoom it around the world. Um, and then, of course, uh, the work we've been doing in our geospatial um, area, most of that is based on commercial imagery. And, 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 and so we've been able to continue to press ahead. If anything, this has just highlighted um, the need for the community to move out into this open source realm and to really take advantage of all of the data and tools and resources that are available to us. That's a really good um, uh, embarkation point. Thank you for, the, for those comments to so talk with um, our, um, our speaker, Stu Butow from uh, the Defense Innovation Unit to talk a little bit and dig into that classified versus unclassified um, specificity and what that means. So it'd be great, Steve, if we could, um, uh, uh, or Bucky, if we could talk to you. So to be clear, um, uh, Bucky is the uh, Director of Space Portfolio at Defense Innovation Unit. He's um, also an Air Force Brigadier General with an impressive career commanding combat rescue operations among many other assignments, but we will call him by his preferred um, nom de guerre, the uh, Bucky, his call sign. So we'll do that, Bucky. Um, I also note that you don't actually look like a general. You look more like a Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalist. Uh, maybe you could tell us why that is and a little bit about the DIU. Sure, well, it's uh, early in the morning out here in Silicon Valley. Uh, so when the Defense Innovation Unit was created specifically uh, to make it easier to attract uh, the best and brightest of the commercial talent and bring their, uh, their products and services into the de uh, Department of Defense to help solve national security problems. Uh, so uh, we're 
uh, the, the only organization in DOD that's focused exclusively on this type of activity. So we work with startups, uh, we work with uh, uh, fo the folks who finance them, uh, but uh, we're not a strategic investor. We are an early adopter customer. And, uh, and so that's been a, a real pleasure uh, working with us. And, and we work with companies, small, medium, large. Uh, we've done work with uh, Tony uh, and, uh, and his group uh, in, uh, in multiple forms. And, and it's really, a, it, it's a wonderful uh, experience. The, um, you touched on something very important though about the uh, classification issue. You know, the, um, uh, we, if you really think about it, there's, uh, uh, there's true intelligence and intelligence isn't just a picture from space. It's, it's a picture that's required some analysis from trained professionals that, like the folks that we work who at NGA and, and folks in the military who, who have a, made a profession of how to interpret these things. But uh, as Tony uh, um, highlighted uh, in, the, in the public sector, you know, the, this imagery is used for a variety of different ways. And for national security, we wanna see this used uh, in the same way uh, because the, uh, 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 the advanced warning, early indications of warning, things that you can learn from imagery can help lower the temperature of conflict and, and help to um, afford more time for diplomatic solutions so that we don't always have to be uh, you know, geared to a, a kinetic, uh, potentially dangerous uh, military uh, resolution uh, to, uh, to conflict. Great. Well, thank you for that. And you, um, uh, well, one thing I uh, noted in reading uh, ab about you, you published a report this past summer with um, Space Force and Air Force colleagues on the, the status mm -hmm. of the state of the space industrial base. I'd be curious if you could share with the audience a little bit about the current state of the U.S. space industrial base in, in the context of a few different things. Um, we had a question about competition from other mm -hmm. countries, what their, um, and some of that might be state-owned uh, industrial base rather than commercial. Um, and then also how it um, uh, is, has been impacted by COVID-19, not trying to insinuate that into every element of the discussion, but it just obviously changes supply chains and the like. So if you, if you could enlighten us on that report. Well, you know, uh, some obvious points. Uh, we we uh, enjoy a free market economy, and that, that market uh, responds, uh, you know, uh, to crises. And so, when COVID struck, um, there was a contraction of of capital, uh, and most of the uh, commercial new space activities in the United States, seventy percent of them are are financed through uh, venture capital and other types of uh, private investments like that. And actually, that. That's a great advantage to us in the government because uh, those are dollars that we're not spending. Uh, we want to leverage that, that private investment in companies like Maxar and, uh, and take advantage of the best uh, commercial capabilities that are out there without having to, uh, uh, to be the, the sole uh, financier of them. So the, so the market's contracted. And of course, the government, uh, it, doesn't, uh, is, it reallocates funds too. So the, so the, uh, the industry was left rather exposed uh, there are other economies, uh, uh, China in particular, which is centrally managed, and, um, and a, a lot of the um, competitors, uh, early startups who are focusing on uh, wanting to be the Maxar of the future, uh, they, they, they had no problem getting uh, funding uh, during this uh, COVID crisis. So that's, that's one of the things that we have to keep in, in, in perspective uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, and uh, one other thing thing I think was very important about that is that um, it, it's how we, uh, you know, commercial is a great tool um, to use in, in conjunction with our, with our friends, allies, regional partners elsewhere. Uh, commercial data is unclassified, it's widely available, uh, as Ellen mentioned, and, and, uh, and it, it, it's, it can serve as a basis of trust, you know, uh, and, that, uh, and greater interoperability not just uh, in times of conflict, but uh, during peacetime operations, uh, uh, humanitarian relief operations and the like. So, um, so uh, we're motivated to try to build uh, an economic uh, architecture that not just supports the US uh, space industrial base, but also uh, the broader space industrial base, including uh, friends and partners uh, from uh, uh, Europe and, and elsewhere. 
That's great. And I also noted in your report, um, we don't, we, this is for another dialogue on another day, um, you call for different ways to finance some of these activities, like a, a, a space mm -hmm. exchange and space bonds. So we can do a whole uh, financing a discussion around this. But one point I did wanna, that really struck me from your um, analysis is the need for STEM educated workers in the, in the US to be able to staff, fund, research, develop, um, we talk about this constantly in all sorts of different facets of mm -hmm. uh, foreign policy, not just uh, in geo int, but, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit because you are all very smart people on this call, as mentioned, much smarter than me. How are we going to build more of you? Yeah, well, the, uh, I tell you what, the, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a, a study, I can't remember the source, but they, uh, they said that something like seven out of 10 uh, students in China want to be astronauts. And seven out of 10 kids in the United States want to be uh, YouTube video bloggers. <laughs> so this is a real statement of uh, how much work we have ahead of us. And, and it's why things like Ar the Artemis program, you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, or Tony did about uh, putting the first woman uh, on, on the moon. Uh, these things are really important. Uh, we need more women in, 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 in uh, science, technology, education, uh, engineering, and math. And, uh, and there's, uh, there's things that we can do effectively to, to help incentivize that because uh, we know, uh, I have no problem admitting that uh, women are smarter than men <laughs> on this call. So, uh, you know, uh, exactly. So why aren't we leveraging that? And then, and, um, uh, and there, there's other challenges, but, you know, I, I think we're, I think we're heading in the right direction. I, I'm constantly uh, amazed at the quality of the people uh, that we're working with, many of whom are, are much younger than all of us on the call. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, it, it, it's, we're in a renaissance right now. Uh, we're, you know, the commercial applications, a lot of the things that Tony was talking about is really fantastic. And, it, and, and not only that, but the innovation aspect is not just inventing something new, but how we combine, um, you know, the uh, electro-optical uh, capabilities of Maxar with maybe some other types of phenomenology or modalities from other companies and use this advanced analytics uh, capability to, uh, to give us new insights uh, to things that, that wouldn't be uh, uh, observable to a human on first pass. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and, and we'll come back to you on a few of those points, but, but uh, very, very, very helpful and insightful and hopeful. I'd um, like to turn to um, Phil now, Phil Chidoba, the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Enterprise Directorate, GeoInt Enterprise Directorate. He's had an impressive career, Phil, in intelligence for the Marine Corps. And we'll have more on that uh, later because it's very relevant to the, to the discussion. But Phil, um, first, I'd like to ask, tell us a little bit about the NGA, its mission, and your role in that mission, if you would, please. Yeah, absolutely, Andrew. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So NGA is the, uh, is the world's premier geospatial intelligence organization. And we produce GeoInt, geospatial intelligence, through imagery analysis, through the analysis of geospatial data. And we provide that intelligence to our nation's policymakers and our warfighters. We do this through an incredible workforce. Uh, and I'm talking world-class workforce. I mean, I come in every day privileged to be among these people. Uh, you know, there was a point in my career where I used to envy people that uh, that worked at NGA. Now I'm just kind of sad for folks who don't work at NGA. <laughs> it's just it's just an incredible experience every day. Our folks uh, are are uh, committed patriots. Uh, they they've dedicated their lives to the security of our nation, uh, and they have mastery of this incredible technology that we use uh, to do GeoIn around the globe. Uh, we provide GeoIn across the spectrum of competition, crisis, and conflict. That includes uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief stuff. It includes public diplomacy, supporting that through uh, the many unclassified uh, GeoIn efforts that we've done uh, over the years. And so it really is a full spectrum organization. And we partner closely across the IC, across DOD, uh, as well as across uh, our allied and coalition partners. And the Five Eyes are incredibly important to us. We talk about that a little bit more uh, as, as we get into this. Uh, my job at NGA is uh, the Associate Director for Capabilities. And so in my portfolio, I have all of the, um, all of the UN capabilities that we use in our business. Uh, and we kind of tackle uh, all the challenges of technology through a directorate that does advanced research. I've got a stable of doctorally prepared scientists there who, uh, who are very forward-leaning and looking at technologies that we might align to our mission. 
And I've got the technology director that actually develops, builds, and delivers the capabilities uh, and keep, uh, keep the agency humming, uh, not only with business processes on a day-to-day -day basis, but with the very sophisticated uh, imaging technology and exploitation technology that we use. That's great. And, and if you could describe for us a bit about um, Admiral Sharp, the direct director of the NGA, his mission, um, his, the, uh, the moonshot vision he's got for the NGA, you've described it as a Kennedy space race feel. I'd love for you to share with, with our audience what that, what that means. Well, I'd, I'd love to do that. Thanks. Uh, I got to tell you, I, I am at NGA uh, probably at the best time in the agency's history with the leadership that we have in place. And Admiral Sharp, who I've known for a little bit, uh, has given up, us this task to do what he calls the moonshot. Uh, the moonshot is, uh, is a mission uh, designed to provide a sure geoin at the right place at the right time uh, for our decision makers in battle uh, and in policy making so that we can hold our adversary strategic forces at risk. And, uh, you know, the moonshot uh, idea is intended to be a metaphor uh, that harkens back to the, uh, the Kennedy space race in the 1960s. Uh, all of us feel uh, that same kind of urgency uh, to, uh, to keep, our, keep our technological advantage ahead of our adversaries. And so you may recall the anecdote uh, down at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, you know, you could ask the, the guy who was providing uh, janitorial services down there what he was doing, what's his mission? And he would tell you, I'm putting a man on the moon. Uh, that incredible unity of purpose, unity of effort is now present at NGA. Uh, and uh, in my particular position, you know, I kind of decompose the moonshot and put a finer point on it. And I talk about uh, sensor to shooter, sensor to decision maker uh, timelines, truncating the, 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 uh, the timelines that presently take hours, perhaps, uh, and being able to do that stuff in minutes. Uh, this is generally, uh, you know, uh, John Boyd uh, theory here, OODA loop stuff. Uh, but we want to we want to marshal all the brain power and all the technology that we have uh, to get that moonshot and make it real. So we're we're super excited uh, when we talk about the moonshot. You'll see everybody's eyes light up and everybody's brain go into high gear at NGA. That's very exciting. Um, and to get to, to build on that John Boyd reference, you know, the guy who makes the the, the fast, better decision uh, wins. You make a point about, and this is of course entitled um, uh, uh, "Actionable Intelligence During Crises." Um, and uh, uh, you put the, the word action and actionable. Tell us a little bit about what actionable intelligence means. And you can reference a little bit about your uh, Marine Corps time. I mean, you've done some service. Thank you for it in, in, in the field um, during um, Desert Shield, Storm uh, um, in Iraq. Um, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, you know, it, 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 does, it does have deep meaning, uh, you know, in a military context in particular. And uh, you know, and I know that some of our adversaries had studied U.S. joint warfighting concepts ever since Desert Storm because of what we were able to do so effectively in that environment. Uh, and I think what folks understand very clearly, all of us, is that speed and agility matter. It really, really matters. Being able to render well-informed decisions uh, uh, across a large scale with speed and accuracy uh, really determine who wins in any time of, you know, in any kind of conflict, but most importantly, in an existential one. So actionable intelligence, you know, when we think about it in, a, in the context of combat, uh, you know, it really has this temporal context, right? And uh, if I were to graph it for you, uh, you know, we would acknowledge that time and resources, you know, play into this. Uh, and also our certainty would increase as we apply time and resources to a problem. We may never reach 100% threshold of certainty, uh, but we approach that in kind of an S-curve way, right? Here's the important part. If you extend that timeline, it becomes a bell curve. Your information actually becomes less relevant and less accurate over time because the enemy doesn't just have an independent will to survive. They've got an independent will to prevail too. This is super important when we think about the speed that we need to generate to dominate these decision cycles. That um, is meaningful, especially coming from a former Scud hunter like yourself who remembers this business when you worked in film. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And, and I'd like to come back now to Bucky on this point because that speed issue is a big one. And I wonder if we could just be, be a little provocative and talk about the interplay between geo intel and diplomacy and the timelines involved there, Bucky, if that's something you'd care to expand upon. Well, sure. You know, the uh, uh, I, 
I'm a military guy, so uh, uh, I'm probably you know, not saying anything new to the diplomats, but you know, diplomacy takes time. <laughs> and so, right? So uh, Phil and I come out of an environment where uh, we, uh, we, we like to, you know, we want to take advantage of, uh, of the speed and, and, and have decisive action. And, then, and uh, but uh, what we really need, uh, in, in addition to having low latency, uh, trusted, um, very good sources of, of, of information uh, for situational awareness and decision making in the field. Our diplomats also need that, and and uh, but a little bit different. And uh, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, and Tony referenced this earlier with the uh, the uh, incredible uh, advances in in um, computer vision. Um, you know, big data science for uh, so that we're using algorithms to to do things that <clears throat> are just humanly impossible. So imagine if you ingest all the available imagery uh, over an entire country, uh, not just from commercial resources, but from uh, open source, from from um, from the best satellites that we have in the military and the intelligence community, and you can and you can uh, process that data. And and derive insights that would give give you some you know pa- uh, 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 indicators uh, patterns of life uh, indications of maybe something that's uh, that could be problematic uh, and uh, it could be uh, a mass migration to a border or it could be any any number of things that could be an, an indicator of, of conflict uh, these are, this is a type of information that our our diplomats need so that they can they can get uh, early engage early. And, and hopefully avert a, a, a conflict. Um, it'd be wonderful if we had this, uh, you know, uh, going into the Serbia crisis and some, some other ones. But uh, I, I think this is one of the greatest challenges that we have. And I, and I do wanna emphasize one other thing, which is, uh, and this is a cautionary note, um, we have to, we have to, we can't sacrifice trust in, in the interest of speed. So uh, the, the, what we do for cybersecurity how, how do we uh, how do we know uh, you know the uh, origin of these sources? Who's touched the data? Uh, this is no different than the banking industry, other industries that that rely on timely uh, uh, accurate information for uh, for their operation. Andrew, right. you got to let me jump in here. Ellen, you know we're coming you know, right you know, back. I'm, I'm, on like, this one. I'm <laughs> you're jumping around in my seat because um, I do work it. for the lead diplomat, so I um, I will just a funny story. Um, again, my first meeting with the secretary, he said that he wanted intelligence at the speed of diplomacy. And I said, I think diplomacy is kind of slow, isn't it? He did not find that very funny um, because this is not a guy and his team are not a group of people that do anything very slowly. But I'll tell you that uh, I did some traveling and I went out to the posts and I met with the ambassadors and I met with those working out in the field. And um, everything that Bucky identified was right on um, in that we needed to do better to push information out in a timely matter to them. And so what we did in INR, working with the rest of the department, is we created a platform called Tempo, the speed of diplomacy, the speed of intelligence. And we've launched it on the top secret side because that's where everything starts in the universe, but in December, we're moving it out onto the secret level, the CIPR net level for those in the Department of Defense. And what that means is, is that now our, many of our products and many of the things that are being done at, the, at, at levels that can be more easily consumed will get out to the posts around the world much more easily. We're very excited about this because we already do so much work at that level. It's just difficult with the architecture we have to get it, to get it out. And so I'm, I'm very excited. Um, at this, and, and we've already seen great feedback at the, at the TSSCI level where um, folks across government are looking at it. For anybody who has access to it, please go look up Tempo. Thanks. Great, thank you for sharing that. And, and, um, and I'm glad to hear that you're acting on that. Um, I, I wanna, we have questions, our Slack is blowing up right now with questions from, from the audience, but I have one more point. I want a separate point, new, I wanna go back to Phil on before we bring Tony back in and answer some of these um, questions, and that's a philosophical question um, that I want to go back to Phil on, and that is the idea of GeoInt in and of itself. I alluded to this um, at the very beginning when I joked with Tony about Maxar watching my home at all times. Um, the eye in the sky is watching, and um, it seems like we've got the entire planet mapped and 
15 times a day. We can look at any point on, on earth. Um, Phil, what does that mean for the, the law enforcement theory of, of geopolitics and, and deterrence? If you could share a, a little bit on that, it would be super interesting. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, you know, um, it is interesting. You know, the, the, the globe is covered, right? We've got that unblinking eye in the sky and uh, we get what we call synoptic coverage. We can see everything at once virtually with the, uh, with the uh, constellation uh, and the layered uh, uh, visualization that we can generate from that. And so, um, you know, folks wonder if it's a good or a bad thing all the time. And uh, here's my take on it. Uh, if you think about how cities like London have employed uh, city cams and street cams as part of their, uh, their law enforcement regime. Um, there, is, there is a part of law enforcement theory that uh, suggests that uh, deterrence is achieved not necessarily through the severity of punishment, but rather deterrence is achieved through the certainty of accountability, right? So when folks tend to understand that, um, that activities uh, you know, can be monitored continuously, uh, it'll drive some actors to be a little more surreptitious in, 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 in what they're doing, for sure. But, but generally across the globe, there is this um, mutual assurance that we understand what each other may or may not be doing at any given time. And so when, whether it's compliance monitoring, you know, for arms, arms negotiations and treaties, and treaties whether it's, you know, determining who's building what, uh, what capabilities in the shipyard and so forth, I think it's an important and a very positive dynamic. Um, you know, the question becomes what comes next, right? Uh, we've kind of covered the earth and uh, now how are people going to, how are they going to take off on their, um, their activities uh, uh, in an undetected way? It's, 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 it's an incredibly intriguing prospect. But to Tony's point uh, and, uh, and your discourse with him, I think it's a great thing that, uh, that we're able to, um, to provide this service uh, uh, for the nation's security, as well as for other very, very um, uh, other positive purposes, you know, in, uh, in maintaining uh, uh, safety, uh, like with the California fires, for example, where we partnered across the IC and the DOD uh, to, to help the nation uh, contain that, uh, that disaster. Great. Um, thank you for that. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. Thank you for sharing that point. I'd love to bring um, Tony back in now and field some of these questions, which are, which are well, one or two of which are for him. Um, so if we could um, have him come back in too, that would be fantastic. Um, in the meantime, I do have one that I, it's very specific that I think is a good one probably for Bucky. Um, this is from uh, Alex Gell. Um, and the question is as follows. The U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command developed the nano I satellite several years ago. It was a LEO small satellite that um, reduced its perigee to get well into Earth's atmosphere to increase its image resolution. And the problem was, though, that it would run out of propellant after 10 missions. Um, so this could be a question for Tony, you know, is Maxar considering pairing its satellite servicing sector, such as refueling with remote sensing sectors to conduct similar missions? And uh, for Bucky, is the DIU interested in this kind of capability? Hey, Tony, why don't you take a first crack and I'll come on after you. It's not part of our short term roadmap. <laughs> we are, we're, we're working satellite servicing, but not, <laughs> not that orbit. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was going to say that the you know uh, as the army probably found out you know that uh, uh, you may not be able to uh, recover uh, once you start uh, partially entering the atmosphere. They, but you know what's interesting is that um, um, it, it shows that uh, there is value. In fact, actually, uh, some of some of the uh, Earth observation uh, commercial companies have lowered uh, orbits in order to uh, increase the resolution or capability of their sensors. But that there's a trade space there, right? So the, the life expectancy of the satellite uh, can be jeopardized. Um, but you know what's what uh, it speaks to something more though is that uh, we have an appetite for information, and um, and uh, there's uh, multiple ways to solve this. Uh, the NGA uh, actually uh, several years ago uh, developed a commercial geoint strategy. Uh, and, uh, and is uh, very much the leader in the United States government for deciding how, you know, and under what circumstances commercial capabilities can come in to augment and support um, uh, uh, our community for national security. And, and there's an incredible amount of, uh, of, uh, of innovation there. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at right now is stratolites. So these are, these are high altitude balloons that, uh, that, that have the ability to maintain 
a, a persistent uh, geolocation uh, for sometimes days, weeks, or whatever. Uh, we need, we're looking at all kinds of alternatives because uh, for most of uh, in the latter half of my military career, uh, we, uh, we benefited tremendously from the use of, uh, of airborne uh, drones to, uh, to enhance our situational awareness, uh, things like the Predator and other sensors that uh, uh, many of which the Army uh, flies uh, even today. Uh, but we, uh, we can only operate those in permissive environments, but the, uh, the tactical commanders have, a, have a, a, an appetite for, uh, for uh, the kind of information that uh, video uh, from uh, above provides. And, and, um, and you know, that, that's a tough nut to crack in space. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there, um, there's a lot of commercial innovation um, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see, we'll see where, uh, where things go. But that, I, don't, I don't think that we're gonna be building satellites that, uh, that will uh, operate in that, in that regime just uh, in the near future. Got it. Okay. Well, we, we are getting questions from folks about, uh, from Emma Gilpin, about whether you work with uh, SpaceX or Blue Origin and, and just generally as the cost of smaller, lower resolution satellites, as that cost falls, um, uh, and, and many uh, 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 countries fly their own systems, how, do you, how does the U.S. plan to loop in those systems into the constellation? Yeah. I'll mention one thing from the report, which I think is very profound. Um, and this is, a, this is a NASA observation. And NASA observed that they will probably save between 20 and $30 billion by uh, migrating from a bespoke government launch solution to having the commercial crew uh, you know, services uh, done by SpaceX and, uh, and uh, Boeing, uh, who's also working on, on a, a, a launcher as well. So uh, that's, that's, that's pretty dramatic. And so, it, when we, when we uh, under circumstances where it makes sense for us to use commercial products and services, it can save money for the government. Uh, and that money could be go into uh, other parties in the government or other parties in the national security apparatus. And we certainly have many of those. So, uh, so part of our job is to help find, find uh, the right balance uh, you know, where we can bring in some technology and uh, blend it with other capabilities to, uh, to achieve those kind of uh, efficiencies. That's great. And so Elon Musk really is becoming a Tony Stark, it sounds like. Um, uh, 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 another qu We've gotten a few questions from folks about um, uh, the uh, humanitarian mission and, um, and, 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 and economic mission, how um, these tools and systems, these sensors um, can help in agriculture, not just um, crisis situations. Just kind of curious about the, how that, you, we're obviously talking with a, with a group that's in the intelligence space, so we know what our priority is, but how does that play into um, what you look at and what you do factor into your ability to act in those missions. Maybe that's one uh, uh, for you, Ellen. You know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great follow on to your last question of Bucky, because I'll tell you a lot of it also gets to our partnerships with other countries. So for example, during COVID, we've actually um, launched three different hubs. We created three different hubs in Asia, South America, and Africa, um, where we're using local groups to actually um, exploit their data and their imagery to help us come up with um, potential products that can be used to give us more insight into how they're um, responding to COVID or other, other humanitarian type crises. And so this is where our partnerships and our alliances around the world are critically important um, to not only take advantage of other commercial capabilities, but to, other, to build this coalition of folks who can actually you know, share those insights. And, and, and I'll tell you, this is where our partnership with NGA is also just critically important. You mentioned, you know, NGA's Pathfinder program, which was the beginning to, um, you know, their focus on commercial satellites. And so I'll tell you that we couldn't do what we do in the humanitarian area without our, without the work with, with NGA and, and their, and their analysts to then be able to deliver that product to decision makers or to folks who are responding to crises around the world. Great. Thank you for that. We've, we're getting a bunch of questions about space it's crowding and debris. Um, may, Tony, maybe this is one for you. Um, given the increasing number of space objects, how does your company plan for end of life your assets? Um, is deorbiting and burn up the plan to prevent it becoming too crowded? This is from uh, Sam Howerton from Washington, D.C. Uh, yeah, sure, Andrew. So uh, we do we do deorbit you know, our uh, spacecraft when they uh, achieve end of life. Uh, and so we, we feel it's important, you know, space is a commons. <laughs> so we want to be responsible in terms of how we 
uh, you know, we support that that um, that domain. Uh, but if I could just go back to the last question really quickly, you know, one of the things that we've also seen, and it, it gets to Phil's point about this unblinking eye, that happens through persistence, you know, tapping to all the sensors that are available. And so Maxar has its sensors, but we also tap into other sources. And so one, one example, building on Ellen's point, is the, the European Space Agency has launched a number of very capable assets. And so with the Sentinel, uh, assets, we've been able to leverage that to do change detection at, say, 10 meter resolution to figure out, you know, where there's been persistent, you know, change, say, illegal logging, you know, as an area, and then we could use our high resolution sensors to characterize that change. And so I think we're going to see more of these, these solutions that, that combine insights from multiple, multiple sources. I think it's a, it's a really important trend. Great. And um, we are um, coming to the end. I want to try and squeeze in two more questions. I think this would be a good one for Phil. This is from uh, an international question from uh, Helmut Ganser, who's um, re a retired uh, Brigadier General in the German Armed Forces. Uh, Space-based intelligence depends on the survivability of satellite systems in times of severe crisis and conflict. What's your risk assessment on this regarding Russian and Chinese capabilities? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and, and certainly we're paying close attention to it. So I, I don't think it's any secret that uh, space has emerged as another warfighting domain that we, uh, we, need to be we need to be prepared to defend our assets and even, um, even conduct offensive operations. Uh, at the national level, there certainly is um, a, lot of, a lot of interest and in research in this area. And uh, I know that our allies share those concerns as well. Our adversaries um, um, have no different view than us. Uh, it's going to be contested in times of conflict. And those resources that are so incredibly important to all of us for the reasons that uh, my fellow panelists are describing, um, they're going to be high on the priority list to uh, to neutralize or destroy. And so, this is this is what comes with the um, you know with the very valuable resources that over time we've been able to place into space. Uh, now we need to, we need to uh, be prepared to uh, to deal with the contested environment up there. It, it's a very real um, uh, thing that we're contending with. Great. Okay. Well, we, uh, that's very helpful. But we. Can we can't end on that point. I'd like to come back to um, to Tony, and actually all of you might, might be able to chime in on this for a minute. This is from uh, Jean Ramon Roy. Um, it feels like the private geo-int ecosystem is still young, and I think that's accurate. Of all the viable business models, many remain to spring up. Um, Jean Ramon is curious to know what the panelists believe are the areas where the private sector needs to step up and develop offerings. Maybe we could start with Bucky on that. Yeah, well, so uh, that's beginning to happen, and um, and you know the private sector is really good at, at at niche things. You know, so fill gaps. Don't you know? Don't don't give us things that we already have. You know, okay, let's you know figure out new ways, innovative ways to enhance what we're doing. And I think one of the greatest ones that I think you'll see uh, is brewing on horizon right now is the uh, creation of a, a hybrid architecture that will allow us to exchange uh, secure information between uh, commercial. Uh, saddle, uh, and government allied uh, systems. Uh, so much of the way on uh, kind of the internet of space, if you will, uh, because we're, uh, uh, there's so many sensors and, um, and part of the way that you can reduce that latency uh, is, to, is to do edge computing or you know, uh, uh, compute uh, in situ so, uh, so that we can move information faster to those who need it. So the, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, terrestrial examples of this uh, that, uh, that will find its, uh, their way into space. And, uh, and I think the commercial folks are, um, are the right folks to uh, lead us on that venture. That's great. T Tony, do you want to um, uh, comment on that as well? I know you look at this all, all day long, probably, in your, in your team and group. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think when, when Phil made the point about how do we accelerate these uh, sensor to decision or sensor to shooter you know, timelines, I think that's really where this is going to go, which is, you know, instead of selling individual capabilities, you know, it's how do we provide service level agreements around not just collecting data, but delivery of insight. And so those are some of the areas that we're really putting a lot of energy into, which is, you know, how do we understand how the data is going to be applied? Uh, and then what time frame <laughs> we not only need to collect, but detect and then deliver that to users. And so I, I think, you know, subscription-based models, consumption-based models related to that are going to be, um, they'll, they'll, that's how we'll innovate over the next decade. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. Well, we could go on and on, and, and we probably should have made this a two-hour discussion, but uh, I really appreciate the time that you've all um, dedicated to this. Really informative. We've learned a tremendous amount about GeoInt, about what each of you do. Um, I have a lot more confidence, Tony, that I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, Maxar watching my house 24-7 um, uh, and, uh, and these folks um, uh, uh, monitoring that. So thank you for all that you do and for participating. Um, well, that's I'm afraid that's all we have time for, unfortunately. Um, as always, I'm sorry to have to end it here. Um, it's been very insightful and thought provoking. Thank you again to our distinguished speakers. We appreciate you spending time with us this morning and thank you for sharing your expertise and perspectives on this very cool and important topic. Uh, big thanks to our audience as well. Hundreds of you tuned in from around the world. You asked great, great questions. Um, while we miss you being able to convene uh, with us in person, it's a special privilege and our pleasure to reach you all virtually. So thank you for tuning in. FP's fall events program continues after a brief Thanksgiving hiatus. Uh, we have many more virtual events coming up in December, and I want to especially bring your attention to a timely and topical program we're excited to convene um, virtually. It's actually a re reconvening. It's our second annual food summit, um, and it's going digital. Uh, we held it in person in D.C. last year, but you're all invited to join us virtually on December 2nd and 3rd. The program will address the very serious and urgent topic of global food insecurity, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic. We'll highlight how governments, the global community, and innovators in agriculture and food industry are addressing the challenge of creating a more sustainable and resilient food supply. We have a power pack lineup of speakers, including top government officials, leaders from multilateral institutions and nonprofits, as well as farmers, scientists, and celebrity chefs, one of which I myself will be interviewing, very excited, who are working to transform our global food system. So I encourage you all to check it out. Um, and you can find information on that at foreignpolicy.com slash events. So thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. Take care and see you soon.